you ever had in your life a moment where your life's put on hold and there's a detour coming and delays are coming? Detours and delays never surprise God, but they sure surprise us, don't they? Amen? When He allows the interruption of our plans, it's always on purpose. And then sometimes when we're in detours and delays, we think, okay, what's the purpose of this? When I, I own a deli, I'm not a deli, but a little restaurant deli, I guess it was called, because it was kind of a coffee tea place with food and that. I lost my kidneys, both of them. They had 6% left in them. I had to get rid of the restaurant and go on dialysis. So I was in Dallas for six months. Here we just got the restaurant going, we just started to make some money, and boom, done. Detours, delays in my life. Wondering why? Why, Lord, why now when things were going so well? How come? And sometimes we mistakenly equate smallness with insignificance. And that's an indictment against God's wisdom and planning and ways. Sometimes we think, well, Lord, this is just a small thing. It's not really important. But God wants you to know that you all are important. Every one of you are important to God's life. 587 BC, the city of Jerusalem was destroyed by Babylonian invaders to reduce the Lord's glorious temple to a pile of smoldering rubble. The survivors were marched into exile hundreds of miles away. Strangers and stragglers inhabited the ruins of the city. And decades later, a remnant of Jewish exiles returned to try to rebuild Solomon's great temple. Without Solomon's resources, Solomon was the richest man in the world at the time. Without Solomon's army, he had the biggest army in the entire world. Without Solomon's engineers, he had the greatest engineers in the world. Without Solomon's architects, some of the finest drawers around. Without the laborers, the skillsmen. They didn't have any of those. But what they had was a pile of people that complained. And they found out that their environment became very hostile because of the critics that surrounded them. So while they worked to try to rebuild the temple, the older exiles wept as they remembered the former temple. As they looked at the temple that was being built, they compared the small, unfounded, and insubstantial temple to the big one that was destroyed. So these critics, these complainers, began to oppose what was going on. Morale increased, or moral increased, and the word stopped. For many years, the construction site was abandoned, so they had all these old people coming and all these old timers that used to be in the time of Solomon and saw the temple built, come and criticize what was going on as they tried to rebuild it, and people got so discouraged they just quit. The heck with it. I ain't building this anymore. Then came Haggai, a minor prophet, challenging the people. As he saw the desolate temple left unbuilt, he says, Who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? Otherwise, he's gone, Who is it of you that are complaining? I want to know. How does it look to you now? Look at it. It's ruined. It's not even being built. How does the temple look to you now? This is because of you. 
complaining. Does it not seem to you like nothing? And after asking these questions, he uh, spoke to their conscience. And he says, listen, this is what God says in Haggai 2, 3 and 5. He says, but now be strong. Is that the right scripture? Oh. Haggai 2, 6, 7, 9. He says, but now be strong. Be strong, all you people of the land of war. For I am with you declares the Lord Almighty, my spirit, the spirit remains among you, do not fear. I don't know what's up there. Sorry, I didn't put the scripture down here. This is the PowerPoint that we're starting, and I'm not getting it right. But anyway, he says to them, he says, listen guys, you've got to be strong. Go to work. That's what he's basically saying. Because the Lord's with you. Don't fear. So when you go through detours and delays in your life, you've got to come to the conclusion that you're going to trust in God. You're going to be strong. Because He's with you. Hagrid proceeded to inspire the uninspired, and he says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land, I will shake the nations. What is desired by all nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the house, the former house. Otherwise, he's saying, listen, when this temple is finished being built, this is built for the Messiah, who is to come. He's going to stand in this very temple, This will be the arena for his ministry. This is where his future glory will excel anything that Solomon imagined. This is what he's telling the people. He's trying to encourage them. Have you ever had somebody try to encourage you when you're in your delays? When you have a detour in life? I had many people come and try to encourage me when I was on Dallas. To take me in and drive me in and try to encourage me. In encouragement, you have to either receive it or not receive it. If you receive it, God will help you. If you don't receive it, who's going to help you? Your own discouragement, your own despair, your own disappointments. Then you start blaming yourself. Right? And then you're so discouraged, it's hard to go to the Lord. And it's hard to thank God. And it's hard to serve the Lord. Because you're too discouraged. Jesus says in Zechariah 4, Not by might nor by power, but it's by my spirit. Saith the Lord of hosts. It's not by your strength that you're going to pull yourself out of your detour. You can't. You have no control over your delay. You have no control over your life at that point. You have to trust in God. You have to give it to the Lord. He'll help you. How many here feel that sometimes you're just plodding along in life? Do you know what plodding means? I worked up in Inuvik and I worked on the rigs. And in Inuvik, in the wintertime, there's mud like crazy. And you would walk through town and there'd be mud up to here. So you'd stick your boot in the mud, pull your other boot out, stick it in the mud, pull this one out. It took like half an hour just go a block because it's so muddy. That's what plodding feels like. When you're plodding along in life in your Christian walk, it feels like you're getting nowhere. And if you're getting somewhere, you're getting there really slow. Right? And this is what the temple was felt like when Haggai looked at it. They're just plodding along. Nothing was being done. Nobody was in control. Nobody gave anybody control. So they're just plodding along and nothing was getting done. 
That's what happens when you're delaying detour in life. When your life takes a detour and you're delayed in life, you just plot along. Instead of getting behind God and His Scripture and letting the Lord take care of your life, you plot along. Though they were weak, their efforts were small. And the building in their eyes to them was inferior. These folks, you know, these old people that were there when Solomon built his temple, all they could see was the former temple. They could not see what God wanted to do in their lives at the very moment. All they saw was the past. What Solomon built. How glorious that was. And they were comparing the new thing that God was doing to the old thing, the former thing. And they plotted along because their mind was still in the past and it wasn't yet in the future. If you want to get ahead in Christ, you've got to put your mind in the future and get it out of the past. That's where detour delays come from. You're still in the past. You haven't given it up yet to walk in the future. You can't see the temple that God wants to build in your life. Because you're still looking at the former temple that was there. And Haggai saw this when he came in. He saw the ruins. And he says, I've got to take care of this. I have to come in and I have to inspire these people and get them to work somehow. Get their minds set on what God wants to do somehow in their lives in this particular moment. They built one stone upon another. One foundation upon another. <coughs> That's what it takes. You have to build one foundation upon another. You can't expect to do everything in your Christian life all at once. It's one step at a time. Yeah. What's that old song? One day at a time. Sweet Jesus. That's all I ask of you. That's all we need to do is ask God for one day at a time. What do you want to do in my life today? What can I do for you today? We can't look at tomorrow or the future or years down the road. Ladies. This is just the way the ladies are. Women are like this. You can say something to them, they're ten years down the road. <laughs> Automatically. Wow. You can say something to a man and sometimes we go, what? <laughs> right? We're not even four minutes away from that. And our mind's not even four minutes away. But God's built women differently. And they, there's fear there and uncertainty. And they're going, they're ten miles down the road already. One day at a time. John Oxum, he's an author, he said these words. If you place a small place... Is your place a small place? Attended with care. He sent you there. If your place is a large place, ground it with care. Guard it with care, because he sent you there. Whatever your place it is, it's not yours alone, but his. Because he sent you there. Amen? So if you have a small place, or you're walking and it's just a small and significant thing to you, then tend that small insignificant thing with care. Because the Lord has given it to you. If He wants you in a place that is larger, then guard your heart with care. Because He set you there. Do what God's called you to do with care. Because He gave it to you to do. Whatever the Lord has given you to do, whatever place He's put you in in life, He hasn't put you there by yourself. You're not alone. He's there. Because He's the one that put you there. I don't remember who Rick Dempsey was. He's a baseball legend. He said these words, you've got to take it one game at a time. One hitter at a time. You've got to go on doing the things you've talked about and agreed about beforehand. 
You can't get there. You can't get three outs at a time or five runs at a time. You've got to concentrate on each play, each hitter, each pitch. All this makes the game much slower and much clearer. Breaks it down to its smallest part. If you take a game like that, one pitch, one hitter, one inning at a time, and then one game at a time, the next thing you know, you look up and you won. One day at a time. Amen? You can't look at the game of baseball nine innings after the first inning and say, this is what's going to happen on the ninth inning. We're going to be here, here, and here. Because you don't know. Life is one day at a time. One hour at a time. One minute at a time. That's what life is. And you have to take it that way. Where does worry come from? Worry comes from trying to figure out what's going to happen tomorrow, the next day, the next month, the next year. You don't have a clue what's going to happen. Even when you go home today, you haven't got a clue what's going to happen. Because God's in charge of your life. It's one day at a time, moment from moment. That's what life is. If we live there, there won't be so many detours and delays. Detours and delays come from within. Because we want to continue to control our lives. Now, how many know we're not perfect? Who's perfect here? We're not perfect. So we make mistakes. We all make mistakes. There's only one person that's perfect, so why not give him that control? Amen? Let him control your life. He knows how to do it. I want to talk about the agony of delay. Sometimes we say we're waiting on God. And we're doing our best to have patience. We say our motives are pure. We say our hearts are right. But few things are more difficult than godly people who have a desire to do something for God or to be used by Him than the discipline of delay. There's discipline in delay. We can't forge ourselves ahead of God. We can't just say, this is God's will. This is what God wants me to do. I know because the Spirit of God spoke to me. I know what He's telling me what to do. You have to discipline yourself. That comes in prayer. Reading your Word. And we go before God and when our plans are interrupted... We go, why? Why, God? Why? I thought you spoke to me. I thought you told me. I was pretty sure. You know, God isn't really interested in our prayers of why. He's not. Why me, Lord? <laughs> what? I thought you were wrong. God's much more interested in the prayer of who? Who are you going to trust? Christ or you? That's what he's interested in. Are you going to trust Christ with your life? Or are you going to continue to hang on to you and trust you? And then when things go wrong and you're trusting you, and you go, why, Lord? Why does this have to happen? Why did you do this? Well... He didn't do it. You did. Because you didn't put your trust in God. You walked in your own strength. You walked in your own ability, your own thoughts, and your own idiosyncrasies, in your own ways. And then you go, why, Lord? And all he did was waiting for you to give up. <coughs> and trust in you. Amen? Delay is difficult to understand and not enjoyable. I didn't enjoy myself when I lost my kidneys at the beginning. God was really helping us and moving. And I did go to the why me Lord syndrome. Why Lord? Everything was going so well. And then poof, done. I'm back not only to where it was, but it's worse. Why didn't this have to happen? 
God wasn't interested in the why. He was interested in the who. Who are you going to trust me? He had to build some trust in me again. That I would trust him with my life. God helped us so much in the first year. It just amazed me. In one month, he brought $10,000 into our house. I wasn't even working. I trusted God. I believed God. God helped us amazingly. It just blew me away that he would love me so much to do that. Because we put our trust in God in our delay. Delay is difficult to understand and not enjoyable, especially when your plans are attempting to be holy and God honoring. This is the best. I'm trying to honor God. I know I'm honoring God. But everything is just crappy. <laughs> What's going on? You know? You've been there, right? Sometimes in our situation, go, God, I'm doing this for you. Are you really? Have you ever wondered that? When things go wrong, are we really? Do I really need to change my mind on this and get a hold of God and see if I really am? Or is this just for me? It's a good question. Who knows the reason? Only God and Him alone. He may be trying to get your attention to focus your attention upon Him and not your plan. God will delay your purposes as you align yourself with His purpose in your life. Sometimes He just wants to get a hold of your heart so you can grab a hold of Him again in your life. And begin to serve Him the way He's asked you to serve Him. Because we get delayed sometimes in our purposes and plans. We get busy. Well, I'm too busy to go to church, Lord. I'm too busy to read my Bible, Lord. I'm too busy to pray, Lord. i got things to do. And then we become more important to ourselves than God is important to ourselves. Do you understand that? It's me, 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 me. I, 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 I. And now our lives aren't centered upon God anymore. It's centered upon ourselves. We need God out. That's where details of the days can come from. Amen. What we have to do is ask ourselves the question. Can I be faithful to God once again? Put him first. Put him first in everything my life is. My life, my work, my money, my church, my my marriage, my children. Everything. You ask yourself that question. Because he'll ask you that. He'll bring that question to you. Somehow, some way, if God will get a hold of your heart and bring that question back to you. How are you going to put me first? And if you say yes to the Lord, there's a song I want to sing to you. He can work it out. He can work it out. He'll work it out for you. He will work things out and put you on His timetable. He will put you in His plans. He'll make your life so glorious and so wonderful. He'll use you like never before. You'll begin to wonder, why didn't I do this before? Look at Job. He went through all of those struggles. Lost his children, his wife, his land. Everything he owed, he lost. And then God spoke to him asked him 133 questions that he couldn't answer and he came to the conclusion I'm done and God is ah and then God began to rebuild his life and the Bible says he had hundreds of times more than he had when he first began God restored his life because God had to be number one he had to check Satan went before the throne of God and he says where have you been? To and fro about the face of the earth to see who I can devour. Have you considered my servant Job? Oh, I want to get at Job. He's such a godly man. 
I want to get at them. Can I get at them? God gave them permission. Go ahead. But don't kill them. Do what you want with them, but don't kill them. What I'm saying is sometimes your purpose and plans are delayed because God sets himself towards you trying to get your heart. Trying to get you to come before him and give everything you have to him and rely upon him for everything. But sometimes in our human nature, we want to keep a hold of things, don't we? Amen? You're not getting a bite of my sandwich. It's mine. And the cookies, forget it. Stay away. That's what we do before the Lord sometimes. Stay away. And then comes the delay. The old folks who came against the temple, their lives were delayed because they were on God's time table. They weren't involved in what God was doing there. They just came against it. Timing in the Lord is perfect. His timing is perfect. Totally. He knows what He's doing. And when you get on His timetable and seek God for your life, Say, Lord, what do you really want me to do with my life? Well, number one, He wants you to give it to Him. When you do that, then He'll give you more purposes in life than you've ever had. Even when you have a direct promise from the Lord concerning His plan, you still try to manipulate your own. Abraham, a direct promise from God and Sarah that they would have a baby. Ten years later, it hasn't happened, so Sarah goes, well, I guess God ain't in our lives, and he's not going to keep his promise. You see, Hagar, she's pretty nice. Go and lay with her and have a child. I give you my permission. Manipulating God's hand because God is not moving. He's not able to move and do what he said he did. He's not able to keep his word, so let's do it for him. He needs our help. That's the way we are in life sometimes. Well, I've asked God for this, and I've asked God for that, and it's been years and years, but nothing's happened. So I'm just going to take it in my own hand and you know, do it for God, because He needs my help. God don't need your help. He needs you to obey. Just like you yell at your kids. Why do you yell at your kids? Because you want them to obey and do what you've asked them to do. Amen? God's not on your timetable. He's got a different timetable for you. And He's just waiting for you to get on it. Amen? Amen. So in closing, when there's detours and delays in your life, what we diligently need to avoid is to take things into our own hands. Can't take things in your own hands. It'll get worse. Otherwise, you will compromise your faith, your walk with God, and you'll miss out what God wants for you in your life. You'll miss it. It'll bypass you because you're not looking for God to move. You're looking for yourself. To fix the situation. So guard against making quick decisions. And snap judgments whenever possible. Bring them to the altar and pray. Say God this is what's in my heart. Am I thinking right? I always. When I make a snap decision in my heart. I, I Sometimes I phone my pastor. Says, pastor this is the situation. This is what I want to do. Am I thinking right? Because people are precious. And you don't want to hurt people's lives by making the wrong decision for them. So I ask him, because I need his, his input, because he's, you know, been preaching for a long time, and he's my pastor, he's my headship. So I said, Pastor, I need your advice. I don't want to make a snap decision. Because that was, that's what Abraham and Sarah did. After 10 years, they made a snap decision and took advice and had Ishmael. And now we still have the wars of Ishmael and Isaac 
raging in the world today because of that snap decision. Be careful who you listen to. Even those closest to you can lead you astray with bad advice. Sarah led Abraham astray with bad advice. Sarah led Hagar astray. And Abraham again, bad advice by asking Abraham to take Hagar out of their company because she saw Ishmael and bullying Isaac. And they didn't like it. Just get that woman out of here. And that's where the conflicts have come for all generations. That's where the fighting comes from the Muslims and Christians. It's right from that decision, snap decision of Sarah. So when you seek God's will, don't let the influence of your former lifestyle influence you. It can. But let your conscience be seared by the Word of God. And that'll help you. Amen? Because we can't go back to situations in our lives where we've, before we were Christians, that we've made decisions. And we can go back to that. But Jesus says, you're not out of the world now. Old things have passed away. All things become brand new. That means now we have to go here. So Lord, what do I do now? Show me in your word. Are you before me? Talk to me about it. I'll say, well, here's some scripture for you. Or I'll give you some advice. You can look it up in the Bible. And get God to talk to you through the word of God. Always choose methods and strategies that are in harmony with the gospel. With scripture. Then you will never select a method of dealing with the delay that contradicts the revealed word of God. Always get it from Scripture. And the Word of God will move your hearts. And when you allow God's Word to move your heart, you're in good hands. Can you say amen? Yeah. You know, our problems are never not spiritual. They're always spiritual. There's only two forces working against your life. Heaven and hell. Jesus and Satan. <clears throat> One of them wants you. And whoever you let pull on you, the longest and the hardest will get you. And then you begin to serve that spirit. So you've got to be careful in your decisions. Because it's always safe to put on the armor of God. Just put on the full armor of God, the breastplate of salvation, the helmet of salvation, the blessed breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, having your feet planted. That's all talking about the Word. Get saved, put on the belt of truth, put on the breastplate of righteousness, do what is right, and have your feet planted in the Word. When you do that, you'll be fine. But when you're tempted and deceived, that's the accuser of the brethren. And it's a continued reality, isn't it? He's always tempting us. No matter how long you live for Christ, he'll always tempt you. That's why it's so important to know your word, know how to pray, and know how to say no. This temple would have never got built if the people that got discouraged kept discouraged. Even when Haggai went and talked to them and tried to undiscourage them and give them some hope. Hey, the Lord's behind you. Don't worry. The Lord is behind you. He's going to help you. And with those words, they got out of the discouragement and built the temple of God. Does that mean they had no opposition? They had lots of opposition. People were trying to kill them as they were building the temple. So they put a guard beside the person that was working, so he took care of watching anybody trying to attack to protect them. Jesus Christ is your guard. He's always there with you. Lo and behold, I shall never leave nor forsake you. I shall always be with you. So you have to allow him to protect you. Amen? 
and that's doing what's right. There's an old song that uh, Kenny Marks sings, he's an old Christian singer. He says, you know what's right, but you don't want to do it. So you throw it all away. It's a good song. And that's where some people live. Instead of giving in to Christ, saying, okay, Lord, I'm done with trying to, you know, take care of my own life here. You have it. You take care of it. I'm done. I've blown it. I don't know how to do this. Let's bow our heads. Amen. Detour delays. Sometimes they can be delayed by Satan, delayed by God, or delayed by yourself. Who are you going to believe? Who are you going to trust? God or yourself? You're here this morning, you're not saved, you don't know Christ as your Savior, or maybe you have received Christ, but you've walked away because of detours and delays, because of the things you've done, because of the attacks of Satan and you didn't know how to deal with them. A reason you don't even know why. And you want to come back to Jesus and say, Jesus, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I want to begin anew, living for you from this day forward. God's speaking to you. That's you. You're here. We're not doing this to embarrass you. We're doing this because we love you and we want you to make heaven your home with us. Amen? That's you, God, speaking to you. Raise your hand. I'll pray for you. And one hand going up, two hands going up. Be honest with God. This is you and God alone. Be honest with God. One more time. Okay. You lifted your hand. Did you mean that? Did you mean that in the back? Amen. Can I pray for you? Will you allow me to come up here and I can pray for you? And then will you allow that? Well, come on up. Amen. Anybody else wants to give their life to the Lord or begin their life fresh with Christ, you come on up and pray for you. Jesus publicly died for you. That's why we publicly ask you to come up and receive Christ or give your life back to the Lord. Give your life back to the Lord and say, I'm tired of controlling my life myself. You take it, God. I'm done. I want to fully give it to you. I'm done. Anybody else? Okay. Just repeat these words for us. Lord Jesus, forgive me for trying to live my life without you. Come back into my heart and live there and forgive me of my sin. In Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you for Amy. Father, we ask you by the blood of Jesus Christ put a hedge upon her heart, mind, soul, and spirit that the word of God pierce her heart, God, that she may live for you. Give her understanding, Father, of the word of God. Father, I thank you for today. Lord, in Jesus' name, I ask you, Father God, Lord Jesus, to move and minister like you've never done before in his life. God, use it for your purpose and glory. Praise the Lord. That's what it's all about, folks. We will go down see you again. Thank you. Amen. If God has delayed your life, if you've delayed your life, or you think Satan has delayed your life, when those times come, you've got to fight. And how you fight is you just keep going on. You keep going to church. You keep believing God. You keep reading your word. And you just, when the temptation comes, you just think that. You want to control or you want to do that you know is not right, say no. It's the shortest word, no, and oh, but the hardest one to say sometimes, right? Amen? Yeah. It's easy to say yes. You know why? Because no is like this, no. Now you're frowning. Ever try to say no with a smile? No. Kind of looks stupid, feels stupid. <laughs> Well, when you say yes, you can't help but smile because yes makes you smile. Yes. Mm. 
How can you say yes without? How can you say yes frowning? 